I'd like you to picture a huge stage with 36 young women dressed in identical outfits, smiling and dancing while doing eye-high kicks in perfect unison. Who are these young women? The Rockettes from Radio City Musical. I have had the pleasure of becoming friends with two former Rockettes, and I'd like to share their stories with you. Vicki Stance had always wanted to be a Rockette when she was growing up in New Jersey during the 1930s. Not a Broadway dancer, a Rockette. She liked the precision. She liked the 36 of them. That's what she wanted to be. So she took tap lessons, she took jazz lessons, she took ballet lessons. Ballet, I have learned as a student of dance, is the, is the basis for all dance. Um, she auditioned and was hired as a Rockette in 1943. She said to me, the first number I danced in was the Shoemaker's Holiday. I learned that number forwards and backwards. I could have done it with my eyes closed. But that first time while I was waiting to go out on stage, I was excited, but I was also praying that I didn't make a mistake. I said, what about the, the, the toy soldier dance, especially when you all fall over? She goes, oh, that's easy. The Rockettes have been doing that since the beginning of time. It's just a matter of timing. There are three Rockettes who are off stage who are catching all of us. And I thought, just a matter of timing. Since when is timing easy? <laughs> um, and she told me, you know, it looks like we're hooked up together often, especially when we're doing those eye-high jump kicks, but we are not putting any weight on the girls on our sides. We are responsible for our own balance and we are not allowed to do more than barely touch them, if, if that. She said, I had a wonderful time as a Rockette. There was nothing, there's nothing in the world like being out on that huge stage with 35 other dancers. Now, the stage at Radio City Music Hall, well, Radio City Music Hall is the largest indoor theater in the world. The stage is 100 feet wide and 160 feet deep. It's a third of a football field, okay? Even with 36 people, a third of a football field is a lot of territory to cover. Uh, it opened 80 years and six days ago, December 27th, 1932. I won't be able to say that again. <laughs> 80 years and six days. And on the opening night, there were stars such as Ray Bolger, the Flying Walendas, you know, the trapeze artists, Martha Graham and her modern dance uh, group, as well as the Rockettes. So when Vicki said, we've been doing the, the toy soldier dance from the beginning of time, she was talking about since December of 1932. Um, she's told me Radio City Music Hall had everything you wanted. If I had an early re rehearsal, I would stay in the dormitory rather than going home to New Jersey. There, uh, I could get a meal in the cafeteria. I could see a movie in the movie room. There was a nurse on duty at all times. And on the, uh, the shows often had animals and there were rooms for all the animals. Radio, uh, you, Radio City had a place for everything. But she left the Rockettes to, adjoin, to join an adagio act. That's an uh, adagio acts are a combination of acrobatics and ballet. And she was in a three-person adagio act. A big man, there, and then Vicky, and then there was a little man. So when they were balancing, Vicky was in the middle. The little man crawled up the two of them and got up on top. They toured around the country on the vaudeville circuit. But once, uh, when they were back in New York City playing in one of the smaller theaters, their agent called them up and said, 
the balancing act at Radio City Music Hall has an injury. You're the replacement. And Vicky said, that huge stage seemed even huger when there were just the three of us on it. But, just, but being part of the Adagio Act was the biggest thrill of my life. She got married while she was playing at Radio City Music Hall. Her fiance came back from World War II, and during a break between shows, they went around to the little church around the corner and got married, and then she finished the shows for the day. Her last job as a performer was at the Apollo Theater, also a very famous theater in New York City. I met Vicki when she was a great-grandmother in, I assume, her early 80s. We were both taking tap dance classes at the Clifton Park Senior Center. <laughs> Vicki didn't do the quick turns anymore, but she knew all the steps. She would happily coach you in a friendly manner, not a, that's not how you do it. No, a little, you know, a little, you know, a very encouraging manner. And her hands, her hands were always beautifully positioned, very graceful. I like to stand behind her and try to mimic what she was doing. And the teacher of our class was another rockette, Janet Murphy. Janet decided she wanted to be a rockette when she was 15. Her dance teacher, Doris, had a former student visiting her. This former student was a current rockette. And when the current Rockette saw Janet do her high kicks, she said, with kicks like that, you should be a Rockette. Janet had thought she wanted to be a ballet uh, dancer, but now she changed her mind. Now, she had been hearing about the Rockettes ever since she was eight and had started taking lessons with Doris. Doris had tried out for the Rockettes probably about the time Vicky uh, tried out, in the 40s or 50s. And she, to this day, tells the story. The first thing they do when you audition for the Rockettes is line you up against the measuring stick on the wall. At that time, you could, had to be between 5'3 and 5'9. There's always a range. But she said, I was a quarter inch too short. A quarter inch! They wouldn't even let me dance. They said, you're too short. <laughs> a quarter inch! Um, that doesn't seem quite fair, but you have to put the line somewhere. But so Janet started practicing to be a rockette. She did a thousand kicks a day. Not all at once, no, in groups of two or three hundred. And by the time she was a uh, teenager, 15 or 16, she was teaching dance classes. So she would sneak in some of her high kicks then. She uh, auditioned and got um, a job as a substitute Rockette. At that time, Rockettes got contracts for life. Yeah. And so she was waiting for somebody to retire till she got a permanent position. But she was on call to, you know, when somebody got ill. And uh, she was there during, oh, her, her, her first time that she performed there, she told me, I'm too stupid to be nervous. I was just excited and ready to go out there. When I got out on stage, I could see my family and friends and Doris, my teacher, in the second row. And when they saw me, there was like a, a wave of white. The Kleenex started getting passed down the row. And then they started waving them at me. <laughs> Everybody was very happy that, that Janet was a rockette. She was there for the 50th anniversary in 1982. Uh, the, the big number for that was Dancing in Diamonds. Their costume was made by Bob Mackey. And you ladies may remember that Carol Burnett, her fancy slinky costumes, they were made by Bob Mackey. This Dancing in Diamonds outfit had, there was a, a cape that extended from the left fingertips to the body, but the right side was a sleeve. So you could, you could imagine all 36 of them, you know, if they're just waving their left arms, you've got this beautiful cape going back and forth. But they're, if they turn sideways, then it's the right arm, it's, it's normal. So it was uh, fantastic things. 
the costumes cost two thousand dollars each, and in 1982 you could probably buy half a car, or or that's odd, uh, <laughs> a fairly good used car for two thousand uh, dollars. Janet said, "Oh, and they had a head an elaborate headdress too." Janet said, I was really rough on my costume. Beads were always flying off, and after the performance, I would go out on stage and try to find them so the wardrobe ladies could sign, uh, uh, sew them back on. You know, we were dressed. Every outfit we got in, we were helped into it by dressers. I tried to get in my first outfit by myself. and was told, you do not touch the costumes. We put you in it. And the costumes have the names of each Rockette who has worn it uh, put on, in, on the inside. Um, unfortunately, while Janet was still a substitute Rockette, her home burned down in Utica. And she had to get a full-time job uh, in retail. And uh, as she continues to this day, um, teaching dance on the side. She's teaching... 28 classes at Galway, um, the kids there, on, on Wednesday and Thursday nights, and at this, uh, various other places, older people. One day, she and Vicky brought in photographs of them when they were Rockettes. And there they were, statuesque, beautiful, smiling in these elaborate costumes. Oh, and when Rockettes are ever posed uh, for a picture, the ones on the right go like this. Well, um, the, one on, the ones on the right end go like this, and they, everyone on the right pops their right knee, and the ones on the left side pop their left knee. And, uh, and the things Janet has taught us that when you're not touching each other, but it looks like you're hooked up, it's your left arm is low and your right arm is up. You don't want to see people kind of, <laughs> you don't get together with sort of a windmill effect. It, it's, it's not done. You, you, you go at each other this way, so you don't, uh, your arms don't get tangled. And, and oh, when you line up, they always line up the tallest ones in the middle and then drop down to the shorter ones. There still is a five, six inch range in, in their heights. Well, Vicki stopped dancing with us when I think she was in her mid 80s. She had various health issues and she moved into the Kingsway community in Schenectady. And then we heard that she had cancer. So we decided we would go over and perform for her. We perform a couple of times a year. Not, not a lot, but we decided we would, we would dance for her. And when we got there, we carpooled over. We walked past the dining room. We could see it was about 20 minutes before performance, and people had started to gather. And then we were shown into their activities room where we could change our clothes. Um, and Janet said, I've got bad news. Vicki died in her sleep last night. Oh. You know, the last thing we wanted to do was dance, but there were people waiting for us. What helped me was I saw that on their uh, bulletin board, pictures from their last Wii bowling tournament, you know, the video, TV video game thing. And there was Vicky. She uh, obviously had just had a strike, and, and she still had her beautiful smile, and she was excited. So, uh, so you know, the show must go on. So we did our dances. Janet somehow managed to sing the song, What I Did for Love, which was from the musical chorus line, and it's all about dancing for the love of it. And I told this story. My story about two rockets. Thank you.